and to spiritual evolution. So because it's so revolutionary, let's give you a tool that you can use inside of uh, the normal um, way that, that uh, we live, hopefully, includes uh, forgiveness, and the normal messages and teachings of most spiritual teachers. Because, you know, there may come a time when you want to use forgiveness whether you have to or not, okay? So I want to give you this forgiveness tool. It's helped a lot of people in my workshops and retreats. And it's a tool that takes us uh, to a place of being able to easily forgive another by coming to a, an awareness of uh, four or five simple truths uh, that it's important for us to embrace in life. Simple but profound spiritual truths. Truth number one, nobody does anything they don't want to do. See? That's a profound understanding. Let me repeat it. I said, nobody does anything they don't want to do. Now that, that carries implications that are not uh, simple or, or uh, unimportant. Uh, if it's true that nobody does anything they don't want to do, then it's true that you have never done anything you don't want to do and no one else has ever done anything that they, they don't want to do in their life. Uh, understanding that requires us to go to the next level. See, we, well, let, me, let me explain why. Well, if, we, if we think that people do things they don't want to do, that, that they're capable of doing something they didn't want to do, then we have um, a whole different reason to forgive them. And we can, and this is especially true of forgiving ourselves, yeah? We can write off our own transgressions, if you want to call them that, by, by uh, uh, imagining that, well, we don't really, I didn't really want to do that. I, I didn't really want to, to do that. It, it, that just came over me, or it's something that had happened, or, uh, or, or I, you know, we kind of give ourselves an excuse that's, you know, well, yeah, Red Fox, the old comedian who you might uh, be way too young to even know who I'm talking about, but if you're over 50, you'll recall a, a, a comedian who was on television for a while named Red Fox who used to say, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. And uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a standard little one-liner that he used to explain himself away when he did stuff that he wanted to pretend he didn't want to do. So here, here's the important part of that lesson. Nobody does anything they don't want to do. They just say that they don't want to do it. Now let me give you an example in a real simple way. Um, uh, your wife comes home, uh, uh, or your husband, your spouse comes home with tickets to the opera. And uh, you've got tickets to the opera tonight. Let's go. Um, your first reaction is, the last thing I wanted to do tonight, or for that matter, any night for the rest of my life, is to go to an opera. So, uh, but, so it's something you don't want to do. But uh, you decide you're going to go anyway. Uh, because your spouse has made it very clear that they're very excited about going to the opera. These are $67 a piece tickets. Uh, they got them, you know, through some fluke at the office, whatever happened, and and um, so we got to go. You know, they're really good seats, and and you're going to love the opera. And besides, you know, if you don't go, if you really make me go by myself, or call a girlfriend, or call some other guy to go with me, I'm I'm not going to be feeling really good about you for a number of days, which could have implications that we don't need to discuss on camera. So you decide, okay, for a whole pile of reasons. I'm going to go to the opera. So you go to the opera, but you kind of like, kind of like snooze through it, or at least you're not paying, let's say, the greatest amount of attention to it. It's pretty clear from the look on your face, if you're even uh, awake, that you're you know, not having that great of a time. Uh, and uh, your spouse gets pretty clearly about one third of the way through that you really aren't very happy. 
So you get home and he or she says to you, wow, you weren't really very happy there. I mean, it didn't feel like you were having a good time at all. And you say, well, you know, the, the, uh, the truth is I didn't want to do it. I didn't, I, I, I didn't want to go. I went because you wanted me to, but I didn't want to go. Lie number one. And that's what I'm getting to here at this first point. You did want to go, or you wouldn't have gone. But you tell yourself that you didn't want to do that because it then allows you to escape all the consequences of everything you did thereafter. Sleeping through the thing, or not demonstrating that you're having a very good time, or in other ways making the evening not completely enjoyable for your spouse. So we tend to use the excuse that we did something we didn't want to do in order to forgive behaviors that we uh, demonstrated thereafter. Now, actually, obviously, you did want to go to the opera, or you wouldn't have gone. See, nobody does anything they don't want to do. You've got to be clear about that. So and we, we've got ourselves convinced that we do things we don't want to do all the time. That allows us to get into resentment for the things that we have done, many of the things we've done that we tell ourselves we didn't really want to do, but I just had to do them, I had to do them. So the point that I want to make here is, that this, this was a point that God made with me in conversations with God, it made it very clear to me how I could get rid of my resentment. Uh, and by the way, how does this tie into the forgiveness process? If I don't think that I have a reason to resent you, then I don't have to forgive you for what I think you did to me that causes me to resent you. Now, do you see the tie-in? So to use a simple example, I don't have to forgive you for forcing me to go to the opera last night. I don't have to forgive you for not picking up on my clues that I really didn't want to go. I don't have to forgive you for putting me in that seat next to you at the opera all night long because I no longer resent you because I realize that in fact I didn't do anything that I didn't want to do. When I accept full responsibility for all the decisions and choices I'm making in my life, when I realize that I cannot do anything that I don't want to do, then I immediately have to let go of my resentment. Any lingering resentment I have or may have with regard to you concerning matters both large and small. So uh, the statement, nobody does anything they don't want to do, drives to motivation. See, it drives to your motivation. If you didn't want to go, then why did you go? Well, if, if I hadn't gone, you, you know, we wouldn't have had any intimacy for probably a week. I mean, you were really hot about these tickets. And I didn't want to be just, you know, given the cold shoulder for the next 15 days. Oh, so then you did want to go to the opera as a means of producing that outcome of not getting the cold shoulder. Well, if you want to put it that way, you see, if we're honest enough to tell ourselves what it is we're trying to achieve by doing what we say we don't want to do, we will then see that we do want to do it for the following reasons. And it's perfectly okay to embrace our responsibility around that choice and decision and stop making it look like someone else forced us to do something. This, of course, works in reverse as well. When we stop allowing someone else to think that we forced them or pressured them in some way to do something by knowing that they too cannot do anything they don't want to do. They can tell you that they didn't want to do it, but obviously they did, or they wouldn't have done it. When we can turn that lazy Susan around, we also then eliminate the need for us to seek forgiveness from them. For us to say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have I guess I shouldn't have made you do that. Now, whenever I, I, I uh, share this particular notion in front of large audiences, someone inevitably gets up and uses a very uh, vivid and sometimes a kind of a brutal example involving violence or some form of human interaction that's extremely unpleasant uh, and difficult to talk about. So they'll say, you know, well, what if, you know, what if you're, you know, being raped? 
You know, or what if, for that matter, to use a funny thing from the old Keystone Cop movies, what if you're walking down the street and a you know, piano hits you on the head? Uh, I didn't say that nobody has anything happen to them that they don't want to have happen to them. I said that nobody does anything that they don't want to do. That means that they don't do anything of their own volition. Interesting word, volition. That they don't do anything of their own volition that they don't want to do. But then again, somebody else will get up at the same lecture and say, okay, fair enough. But that's not true either. What if, what if I say, you know, um, give me your, your, your uh, money or I'll shoot you. You know, the guy who robs you in, in the back alley uh, in New York City. So you're doing something of your volition. I mean, you're reaching into your wallet and giving him your money. So um, you're doing that. It's not happening to you in that sense. You're undertaking an action, yes, and giving him your money. But that, too, is something that you really want to do. Because the, the point that we're making here is that behind every volitional act, there's a choice being made. OK, I'll say that again. Behind every volitional act, there's a choice being made. Even if a guy has a gun to you, you have a choice. You don't have to give him the money. So you might say, well, you know, that's duress. Even the law calls that duress. But uh, I've got to tell you something. The great spiritual truth of all time is there's no such thing as duress. Whoa, what? There's no such thing as duress. Conversations with God says there are no victims and there are no villains. So from a spiritual point of view, you could have said no when the guy put the gun you know, to, to, to your chest and said, your, your money or your life. You could have said, take my life. Actually, there's a wonderful story of a person who actually did that, a well-known person. Her name is Byron Katie. She wrote a book called um, Loving What Is, Loving What Is. And uh, Byron Katie tells the story. I hope I have this right. If I don't, I'm sure uh, uh, we're colleagues. I'm sure Katie will call me and tell me. But I think the way she tells the story is something like this. Katie's walking down the street in a big city, and some guy, in fact, grabs her and pulls her into the alley. He, in fact, takes out a gun and points it at her. It's a true story. And says, essentially, your money or your life, more or less. He just says, give me, give me all the money. And so she reaches into her wallet and decides to give him the money. As she tells the story later, by the way, it wasn't because she was worried about getting killed. She just figured, well, if the guy needs the money that bad, he needs it a lot worse than I do. I'm going to give him the money. So she, that was the reason she gave him the money. But here's what's interesting. The man realized after he got the money from her that she got a pretty good look at him. It was kind of dark. It was nighttime. And he was, I guess, hope, hoping that the cover of darkness would, would allow him to get away with this. But he realized that she had gotten a pretty good look at him. And he said, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to shoot you anyway. You've gotten too good of a look at me. And uh, I can't take a chance that you're going to, you know, that you're going to finger me later. So uh, I, got, I got to shoot you. And Katie looked at the guy. And she said, do the best that you can in this situation. If that's the best you can do in this situation, I understand. Do the best that you can do. The guy was like nonplussed. That is, he didn't know what to do with that. He didn't know where to go with that information. But it caused him to stop for just a minute and reflect on a lot of things in that moment. So many things, in fact, that he just looked at her like she was from Mars. She said, is that the best you can do? If that's the best you can do, OK. And he 